Good afternoon. Welcome to a very special City Club event at the Cleveland Clinic Medical Innovation Summit. I'm Dan Malthrop. I'm CEO of the City Club of Cleveland, also a proud member. It's my privilege and honor to introduce our speaker today, co-founder and partner of Drive Capital, Mark Kwame. At a time when more than half of the country's venture capital, some $33 billion annually, is going to startups in California, it may seem odd we're hosting a discussion on investing in Midwest innovation. But consider this. According to a recent article on Forbes.com, the Midwest makes up 19% of the country's gross domestic product and comes up with 19% of its patents. Yet the region draws only 5% of America's venture capital. It's not for a lack of good entrepreneurial ideas. It's actually a lack of funding. And that's something Mr. Qu Mr. Kwame and his partners hope to change through Drive Capital. In January of this year, Drive Capital closed a $250 million fund, the second largest inaugural fund anyone has raised anywhere in the country in the last year. They've issued their first two checks, $2.5 million to road trippers, $5 million to cross checks, a software company that links fingerprints with medical records, pre preventing identity thieves from getting access to health information. Mr. Kwame was a partner at Sequoia Capital for 12 years, where he led investments in a few companies you might have heard of, LinkedIn, Anyone? No? <laughs> Mark Logic, Cast Iron, FunnyOrDie.com. Prior to co-founding Drive Capital, he was the interim chief investment officer and president of Jobs Ohio, a nonprofit corporation created to run the state's economic development activities. It was there that he, quote, fell in love with the place, Kwame says of Ohio in a 2014 interview. The opportunity that I saw in Ohio and the rest of the Midwest, I really felt like there was something happening here. Mr. Kwame will be in conversation today with City Club's good friend Michael Goldberg, a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Design and Innovation at the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University. Michael Goldberg is an experienced venture capitalist himself and international business leader whose teaching is focused on the fields of entrepreneurship, early stage finance, and startup communities. At Case Western Reserve University, he organized one of their first, but not the first, but one of their first massive open online courses, a MOOC, called Beyond Silicon Valley, Growing Entrepreneurship and Transitioning Economies, which has attracted more than 23,000 students from 183 countries in the spring of 2014. There's another one happening right now. It's on Coursera. Mm -hmm. You can find it right now on your phone. You can find it. You can, you can enroll as we speak. The second session is currently underway, enrolling more than 12,000 students. Michael Goldberg also co-founded Bridge Investment Fund, a venture capital fund focused on investing in Israeli medical device companies that have synergies with the leading healthcare industries and institutions in Cleveland. Mr. Goldberg is a senior advisor to Kaiwu Capital, a Chinese venture capital fund as well. Prior to coming to Cleveland, or returning to Cleveland, I should say, because he did grow up here, Mr. Goldberg was the director of international business development for America Online and spent several years in South Africa working for the National Democratic Institute, designing and implementing education programs for South Africa's historic first democratic election in 1994. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club, it's my pleasure to introduce, you, introduce to you Mark Kwame and Michael Goldberg. All right. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's great to be here. Um, Mark, let me, and we'll start off by having questions for the next 30 minutes uh, that I'll pose to Mark, and then you'll have your chance after the break to ask questions directly to Mark. So let me kick it off by um, that um, conversation you had with then Governor elect Kasich about coming to Ohio. We were talking over lunch. You had been to Ohio once in your life before then. Um, what convinced you to, to move to a place to basically leave the New York Yankees of venture capital at Sequoia and move to Ohio? Uh, he's one hell of a salesman. Um, no, I, I basically, uh, the governor and I were, um, were good friends and uh, had done a lot of things together. And uh, I think it was a, a culmination of multiple different events. Uh, one is I've been very fortunate uh, to have a, a great uh, working career in Silicon Valley. I actually started working at Apple when I was 19. Uh, went up through the ranks, started a company, took a public, and then of course went to a Sequoia Capital. I had never done any real public service. Uh, and I, did, I made a mistake uh, about 20 year, or 15 years ago to tell the governor my life goals. And I was fortunate enough to, uh, to meet most of them except for one of them, which I, I will continue to do, is one of them was to help a million people. 
And he said, well, why don't you come and help 11 million people mm. here in the state of Ohio, and I'll pay you a dollar to do it. Um, and I said, yeah, what a great idea. <laughs> uh, but no, I mean, we just sat down and, and, and you know, originally it was, hey, come, come help a friend out. Uh, let's do it for six months and, uh, and then you can go back and go do what you did. And as was mentioned in the introduction, something strange kind of happened along the way. I kind of fell in love with the state of, uh, state of Ohio and, and what was happening here in the Midwest and decided to stay. And let's talk about Drive. I mean, what, what motivated you to, to eventually leave your position um, with Jobs Ohio and, and found Drive? Well, I mean, what was interesting, when I was at Jobs Ohio, I got to meet some of the world-class entrepreneurs across the state and, and even outside the state. And, you know, you have many of them up here in, uh, up here in Cleveland. You have Yuval at TOA, uh, at TOA. You have Hiro Fujita, uh, what he's doing. You have, uh, you know, folks at Livestream. You have, I mean, you have just world-class entrepreneurs. Uh, the problem was they didn't have access not only just to capital, but they didn't have access to, I call it Silicon Valley style capital. And probably the best example I can use, which is a, a more recent one, is uh, what Sequoia recently did with WhatsApp, uh, which was recently acquired by, uh, by Facebook for $19 billion. Um, face, uh, WhatsApp would not have worked if it was in the Midwest. And the reason why is they had the ability to raise very large sums of money in the Silicon Valley to continue to grow them to a stage hundreds of millions of users in order to then get either go out, you know, go public or be acquired at great deals of money. And what you see here in the Midwest is you have these brilliant entrepreneurs doing really innovative things. And um, in order to break out, they have to decide one thing or another. Either one, I'm going to fund my business by revenue, kind of the traditional Midwestern way of doing it, uh, or I'm going to go out and get venture capital. Well, to go get venture capital, it's really, really, really hard not just to, you know, here, but it's even hard in the Silicon Valley, and you have just billions of dollars being invested in there. So my partner, Chris uh, Olson, and I just sat down and said, you know, if we could have a substantial enough fund, and we kind of used $250 million as, as the size, where we could go in and help these entrepreneurs think big, go after big markets with big opportunities in this wonderful place called the Midwest to start a business, we could reap good returns for our investors. And let's talk about um, that access to capital piece. And um, I know Venture Ohio just put out a report um, recently, and, and uh, unfortunately, the passing of Frank Samuel, um, who was Governor Taft, science and, and technology advisor, yep. and was sort of critical in the third frontier formation. Yep. Um, the role of government in um, supplying capital, um, I mean, basically, in the Venture Ohio report, they talk about a gap. I mean, you've been able to raise um, capital from Drive's yep. perspective. Can you talk about that role of government in, a, in, a, in an ecosystem like Ohio where we don't have um, pr pure private capital to want to support? What role can government play? Well, I mean, in an, in an ideal world, there would be no role. I mean, it, in an ideal world, it be, would be great if you could do what most of venture capitalists do in, in, uh, uh, in California. In fact, most venture capitalists in Silicon Valley on Sand Hill Road don't even take CalPERS money which is basically the public you know, uh, 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 union there. Um, they really want just private, private money, uh, just because this business is a very difficult business, and if you do this business in the open, it even gets more difficult. Um, so they shun public monies to, 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 to most degrees. As, as I think in Ohio, Ohio um, has done three or four things very, very well. As you know, I was um, uh, head of the Department of Development for a couple of months. Uh, and then we went and did Jobs Ohio. So I actually sat on the Third Frontier um, board. I think the Third Frontier project um, idea was, was a brilliant idea. It basically got things kind of kick-started here in the state. And I will tell you, we would not have drive capital here today, I believe, if it wasn't for the Third Frontier. Because what the Third Frontier did is it allowed um, Third Frontier and OVCA, which was put on by, by the state, it allowed to create you know, venture capitalist firms like ESP up here in Cleveland and Draper Triangle in Pittsburgh and Allos Ventures down in Cincinnati. So, for example, Toa Technologies, who started here in Cleveland, would not have happened if it wasn't for ESP and Draper Triangle. 
Uh, you know, and it, when I looked at it uh, when I was Department of Development, if you look at the most jobs that were created by the third frontier, it was done with a very small part of the capital. The overall capital was mainly done by the capital investing in these small entrepreneurial companies and, and doing the things, uh, you know, like Cincy Tech in, in, uh, in, uh, in Cincinnati and Tech Columbus and so on and so forth. Um, so, you know, that created this kind of the primordial ooze, if you will, of an ecosystem that then had all these companies starting to come out of it, which gave us the opportunity and others to, uh, to invest in them. So I think that's one thing that the, 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 uh, the state's done very, very well. I think going forward, you know, quite frankly, we just need to have some great exits like the TOA exit. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it was announced the amount, but it was hundreds of millions of dollar acquisition for a company that was created here in Cleveland. Um, and, you know, there's many others like Symbionics and, and, and others. So I'm, I'm very encouraged by what's going on. What we need to do is we need to hopefully get lucky uh, and have like an exact target, you know, the two and a half billion dollar acquisition in, um, in Indianapolis by Salesforce. We have a couple of those, you know, it will just happen. And the good news, I think the fire starters happen. Now we got to kind of, you know, stoke the flame, if you will, a little bit and then take it from there. Right. Uh, and I agree with you. I think exits will be key to um, limited partners' enthusiasm for investing in funds like Drive and others. You know, on that note, another leg of the stool besides government has been the role of, of some of the donor community. So yep. in Cleveland, we have a very strong foundation community. Yep. Institutions have played a role. I mean, you attracted capital from Ohio State. Yep. Um, sort of a, uh, written about um, pretty because as they took a big position in the fund. Yep. Um, one of the things that the chief financial officer had stated in making that investment is not only were they investing in drive because of the potential return on investment, but also because of the, let's call it the economic development impact of investing in a fund. Share your perspective on um, that idea of trying to get some of the institutions to um, invest in, in venture capital locally. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, venture capital is a really, really, really hard business. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the overall asset class, it's not a good place to invest. What you have to do is find managers who have done it before and, and, and have, had, uh, have, have had success. And so as you know, institutions take a look at it, I think what, what, what they need to do is they need to evaluate the investment premise of that group first. Because at the end of the day, if you don't make money, then you're not going to do it again. And you know, I, I will tell you, I did not leave Sequoia Capital to do a one and out fund. I mean, the economics does not make sense, <laughs> OK? Uh, we believe this is a 20 to 25 year trend. And so I think what we first is we got to make money. But the interesting thing about it is we've, um, we have four companies now here in Ohio, one, two, three, four. And we started investing in April of last year. Um, and we now today have an aggregate of about 150 employees. I think by the end of next year, it'll probably be three to 400 employees. And one thing that's really fun is when one of these things go, it goes, you know? I mean, I, I invested in LinkedIn when it was eight employees. It's now tens of thousands of employees. We invested at Sequoia into Google when it was four people in, uh, in a garage. Uh, we know how big Google is today. And so when one of these companies really goes, it's, it's real fun. So therefore, it does have great economic development type benefits. But first, we've got to focus on how do we actually find companies and entrepreneurs and capabilities that are going after very large markets to create the next cardinal health. You know, if you think about it, you know, again, I, I may, I'm new to this uh, state, but, you know, you think about the 80s was kind of like the last time you saw some of these big companies, you know, st uh, Steris up here, you know, cardinal health. That's kind of the last big entrepreneurial wave that you saw, and so what we're hoping is, here uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, in this century, in this decade, we'll, we'll have the, the beginnings of some world-class companies being created. Right. Um, one of the things that happened in the region up here, it actually happened throughout the state, was as communities like Cleveland were trying to support entrepreneurship, a number of not-for-profit organizations or NGOs were created to play that intermediary role where yep. donors of the state didn't want to directly invest in companies. So up here we have Jumpstart, we have BioEnterprise, yep. Neo, Nortech. Maybe coming from a place where you didn't have NGOs that needed to play that intermediary role, what was your reaction when you moved to the state around the NGO community? And as you've gotten to know the NGOs up here, is it important to have that, that intermediary um, organizations to, to support entrepreneurship growth? Well, I mean, I, my first reaction was, 
this is a terrible idea. I mean, coming from Silicon Valley, just that's something you just don't have, right? And so, you know, first reaction is that. But then you actually look at what's going on in the ecosystem. You know, you look at what, you know, Jumpstart was in instrumental and, in, you know, what was going on at TO TOA and what uh, Cover My Meds, another great company. You look at Cincy Tech, which is the, Cincy, which is the Cincinnati equivalent. I mean, they have done, you know, Akibia, AsureRx, you know, Road Trippers, which we've also invested in, and many other great companies. So the way I look at it is, I think in this, e after learning what was going on, I think uh, this ecosystem needed that. Um, I think the question now is, what's the next step? And the, uh, the interesting thing from my perspective is that, you know, we, we did get a lot of press from OSU investing in the fund, but over 60% of our capital came from outside the Midwest. One thing that, you know, we don't, we don't really publicize this too much, but we had lots of people say no to us. Hundreds of people said no to us. And they said no to us because they didn't see it happening in the Midwest. You know, and they didn't see why, you know, we, we quoted those numbers. 20% of the GDP happens in the Midwest. 20 plus percent of all, 25% uh, of all uh, government research happens in the Midwest. You know, and if you think about it from an economic, uh, um, uh, an economic perspective, I mean, uh, my favorite thing I saw the other day, I don't know if you guys saw this, was just kind of going around the internet. A house in Palo Alto, California, um, an uninhabitable house, on a 10,000 foot piece of land, just sold for $1.8 million, okay? Simultaneously, as I was going through the Columbus business first, a $1.8 million house in Columbus would be the third most expensive house sold in central Ohio. Um, and so the cost of doing business in Silicon Valley now is crazy, okay? I mean, I just had to recruit a CTO to one of my companies that I'm still on the board of in California, and. You know, there are what, not only the salary, was, I won't say the salary, it was ridiculous. Um, you know, signing bonuses, two week vacation for he and his wife anywhere in the world they wanted to go. I mean, it, it just got to be nuts, okay? And so I think what you're gonna see is companies are now waking up to the fact, I'm sure you read recently Amazon's putting a big campus down in central Ohio. I think people are now waking up to the fact going, holy criminy. Um, this doesn't is not sustainable. We got to you know we got to look outside the area, and that that's kind of one of our our, our investment theses. And and I mean, drive you obviously had success raising fund. When you sort of look around at the venture community, even the angel community, I mean, the Venture Ohio report points to this gap. Um, we had an angel tax credit in the state of Ohio that was not renewed. So some some folks are sort of looking at what's happening in terms of sort of capital formation here and saying. This, in, in, in spite of all the things that we've done over the past 10 years through the Third Frontier, through Jumpstart, right. we may be sort of eroding, the Ohio Capital Fund may not be renewed, we may be sort of eroding some of this success. Any thoughts on No, I don't think so. I, I think we've now set it up. I think that the, the plate has been set, so now let's go make it happen. And I, I think you're starting to see the early fruits, you know, like, like we mentioned, uh, TOA and Cover My Meds and Akibia down in Cincinnati, uh, SureRx down in Cincinnati. I mean, I think the early things have been put there, uh, and, and luckily, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll be able to attract folks. I know Draper Triangle just raised a new fund. Uh, NCT just raised a new fund. Uh, Allos is uh, halfway through their current fund. Um, you know, what I want is I want to have four or five or six more uh, drive capital style um, uh, VC firms in the Midwest. And, and quite frankly, I mean, if we have that success, hopefully we will go have that. And, Part of the thing is I think, you know, as Midwestern, I mean, there's a ton of cash in the Midwest. Uh, and if, if, if Midwest investors got uh, comfortable with investing in these sorts of folks and these sorts of managers, I, I think you, you'll see things you hadn't seen in a, in a long, long time. Uh, your most recent investment where you were the lead investor in Udacity, um, yes. a MOOC provider. Um, not a company based in the Midwest. Maybe talk a little bit about the decision. I mean, obviously as a fund, you're, Focus on the Midwest, yes. but you're allowed to do deals from outside. Yep. How do you, that, that decision to sort of put a Silicon Valley MOOC provider in the mix? Well, I mean, basically, uh, I've known Sebastian Thrun uh, for a very long time, and when you make investments in companies, a lot of it has to be around the entrepreneur. Sebastian Thrun is probably the smartest guy on the planet, in, in my opinion. Um, he's the guy that invented the driverless car, he created Google X, he created Street View, he created Google Glass, he cre I mean, he's one of the top AI guys in the world. He's actually a good example of someone the Midwest lost. He was a professor at Carnegie Mellon, a rising star at Carnegie Mellon, and Stanford stole him. Uh, and then he did the Stanford thing, and he's always had a passion for education. 
And he said something to me many, many years ago uh, that, I, that really sat with me. And even when I was at, still at Sequoia, he said, you know, Mark, um, this whole um, area where people would learn, you go to school for four to eight years and then stop learning uh, is not going to work. He says, you know, in computer science today, for example, what you learn in your freshman year is obsolete by the time you graduate your senior year. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you probably know many of these things, too. I mean, the, the, the languages that people talked about, I mean, you know, Ruby was huge two years ago. No one's talking about it. Everyone's talking about Node.js now, you know what I mean? Or they're talking about Android, or they're talking about this. And things move so quickly. And so what, what Sebastian has basically said is, we need to create these nano degrees. And when I brought him here to the Midwest, he goes, oh, this is pretty interesting. Because in Silicon Valley, he just gets one point of view. It's, it's a great point of view. It's technology companies like Google and Salesforce and Cisco, and it's this one point of view. Well, I brought him out here to, to, uh, to uh, Ohio and had to meet with you know, Steve Steinauer, the head of Huntington Bank, had to meet with Lex Wexner, the head of uh, uh, L Brands, had to meet with the head of AEP, had to meet with the head of a couple other you know, very large corporations. He goes, these guys need Udacity too? They need nano degrees? You mean at AAP, you, can't, you have to read? And it just kind of like turned a big light bulb on them. So you're going to see us in the, in the coming weeks or coming months be doing a lot more things around Udacity here for the Midwest. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why I made the investment. But also, um, if we can attract people from around the world in, in training people, and you were mentioning you're going to do something here at the Columbus, at the Cleveland Club here about uh, bringing MOOC students from around the world together. I think that's the other cool thing. One thing I should mention, one of the investment theses we had at, at Drive is that, you know, if you think about Mark Zuckerberg when he started Facebook, he moves Facebook from Boston, pretty high-tech place. He moved it from Boston to Silicon Valley, partly because of the money, partly. He really moved it there because he needed access to world-class engineers who could touch the metal. You know, guys who could build data centers, guys who could build, um, you know, very complex servers, who actually understood network design, bus design, those kinds of things. And uh, they were only in Silicon Valley, okay? You fast forward three or four years with the, what's going on in, um, in cloud computing, whether it's, you know, Azure on Microsoft or Google or, you know, of course, Amazon Web Services, you can now be anywhere. You don't need those folks anymore. The, the, some of the best programmers are coming out of the Midwest. What's the number one computing um, school in the nation? It's Carnegie Mellon, okay? How many folks out of Case Western? I mean, University of Michigan, I think, uh, graduates about 1,000 CS degrees a year. Some of the best and brightest are here. You know, Urbana-Champaign here, you know, is basically where the internet was invented uh, here, you know, straight in the Midwest. So you look at all of those sorts of things, we have the talent, we have the, the raw ingredients, and now because we don't depend on these massive data centers and all that kind of stuff, we can actually build these companies. I mean, Exact Target, Target is a great example of that. Toa is another great example of that. Right. So, so I asked, so Jeff Wiener was an old colleague of mine when oh. I was AOL Time Warner, so I, I emailed him and asked him to, to give two adjectives to describe you as an investor. Oh, how, boy. How do you think Jeff Wiener would have described you? He's the CEO of LinkedIn. Uh, boy, I have no idea. I have no idea. So, so he said, I don't know, he said he, you are enthusiastic and supportive that you were the most bullish board member when it came to LinkedIn's future, even when people thought you were going overboard yeah. in the early days, but you were, you were right on every call. Um, and he said some other nice things. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you know, you, didn't, you should have really sent me the, uh, the truth. Yeah, but um, exactly. talk about partnering with entrepreneurs like Jeff. I mean, you've got this new portfolio. I mean, you've got sort of Sebastian Thrun on one side yep. and a lot of very sort of younger, inexperienced entrepreneurs starting up in the seed stage. What, what is it? What do you do with these guys? What does it mean to be, get an investment from you and drive capital? Well, I mean, you know, one is, you know, it's funny. Uh, when, you're, when you're a venture capital invest, investor, most of your investments, your time with the company, lasts longer than most marriages. Um, and so we really look at it as a long-term kind of relationship. I mean, you know, LinkedIn, for example, and you know, no one thought of anything LinkedIn until a couple of years ago. You know, that, I, I was on the board for 10 years. I remember sitting around, you know, literally the board was Reed, Hoffman, and me uh, going, how are we going to make money? Um, we got to figure this thing out. Um, so it's, it's kind of, you know, through ups and downs and valleys. And so what we're finding is we're finding, um, you know, some world-class folks. One of our portfolio companies in the back there, Avra Informatics out of Green Bay, Wisconsin, who now in Columbus, Ohio. 
And these guys are changing how healthcare is going to be paid for. They are a, uh, they, they do what's called this bundle payments uh, systems. And what they're uh, allowing people to do is basically say, it's no longer this fee for service. We figured out a big data solution that allows you to say, okay, a knee replacement costs X, and we'll figure out how to, how to get all the service providers to, uh, paid for. And, you know, that technology, I mean, it is mind-blowing technology. And this came out of a guy who lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin. You know, everyone forgets the number one, you know, EMR company in the nation is in Madison, Wisconsin. You know, Epic, you know, a multi-hundred billion, you know, hundreds of millions of profit companies. So what we do is we try to find these folks. We try to work with them. You know, in the beginning stages, you're, for lack of a better term, a glorified headhunter. Uh, you're trying to build the management teams around them. I mean, I remember with Reed Hoffman, I, I remember hiring, you know, with him, everybody around him. I remember actually when we gave Jeff Wiener the job over at, uh, at the Rosewood restaurant uh, several years ago, and uh, it was me and David Z and Reed Hoffman gave him the, the CEO job. So, you know, that's what you do. You spend a lot of time. Second thing you really do is you help them uh, find their first or next customer. And, and really understand the value proposition. I've always thought as a venture capitalist is more like a conciliary. You know, it's the, 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 the founder CEO is the godfather, okay? His or her um, decision stands. Whatever that CEO wants to do, that CEO is gonna go do, and that's, you have to empower them to go do that. What I like to see is, you know, the conciliary, hey, did you think about this? Did you think about that? I mean, in my position, I, I, you know, I've now seen hundreds of companies grow and and so it's it's kind of fun just to kind of say hey think about this think about that but at the end of the day it's their decision and you know I, I just really believe that we're the supporting structure one other thing I'd say is I, I was talking to a VC who will remain nameless here in the Midwest who said you know 90% of my work is done before I write the check and I think boy that's the furthest from the truth I mean, 5% of your work is done before you write the check. 90% of the work is done after you write the check. It's, it's all those other things. And the check is just kind of the lubrication that gets the deal done. Right. Let me ask one more question, and then I know we'll take a break, and, and um, we'll get it out to the audience for questions. I mean, a lot of the folks that are here for the summit are focused on healthcare. Yep. Healthcare is among the things that you're investing in. Talk about sort of what, what within the healthcare space are you guys particularly focused on, and where do you think um, I mean, uh, uh, Cleveland is heavy in medical device, which has been yep. a slower um, sort of exit path for investors. It's not something that you guys are focused on. Where, where are yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, we, we are, um, we're really focused on two areas. One is healthcare information technology. Um, I think something that's happened in the last five or ten, five years, five plus years is the whole emergence of uh, the, the EMR. For example, take a look at a fantastic company here in, Columbia, in, in Cleveland, uh, Explorus in population health, the ability to actually take these medical records, anonymize who they are, and really figure out care scenarios and things like that. That was uh, impossible to do five years ago, eight years ago. Um, so we think healthcare IT is fundamentally changing. I already talked about healthcare payments. Uh, we think that whole area in, is, is, is ripe for change. We also think, for example, uh, one of our companies, Crosschecks, uh, allows you to have positive identity of who that person you're giving medical care of. I mean, think about, Think about this, you need your driver's license to go into some of the buildings here, to go up the elevator, but you can walk in a hospital, give them, you know, say, say your name is you know, Mark Kwame, my date of birth, and you get hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical service, and you know, by the, I don't, medical ID theft is about 15%, uh, about 15% of all um, uh, expenditures are medical identity theft. Actually, I had my medical identity theft uh, stolen as well. So, you know, it's, and then, you know, it's a real problem. So, that's, so it's the whole IT, and that allows you, the EMRs and some of these things allow you to do it. The other thing we're very interested in is in the services area. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit in our panel uh, at 4 o'clock, and you know, it's under the term investing in cancer. But I, I really think um, the provision of care is going to fundamentally change. If you think about it, you know, you know, a hospital is this massive place that it's all things to all people. Uh, I actually think we're going to see a lot more narrow networks. I think we're going to see, just like, you know, Cancer Centers of America, I think you're going to see these very narrow networks that are actually going to do things like say, okay, great, you, I actually saw some, look, we're looking at a company right now that's in the total knee and total joint replacement. So I actually sat in OR and watched somebody's knee get replaced, uh, which is, I didn't pass out, so that's all I got to tell you. I was very proud of myself. Um, but, you know, we're looking at that, this whole area, th their efficacy is 100%. You know, you go into a hospital setting, 
three, four, five percent of the people get infections, they get this problem, they get that problem. And so I think these narrow networks and this provision of care is going to be a very interesting investment premise. And that's why I like this conference and I think another area where, the, you know, if you look at the medical institutions, whether it's the Mayo Clinic, whether it's Cleveland Clinic, you know, whether it's uh, uh, Wexner Medical Center, we got some, or, or Children's Hospital down in Cincinnati, we got some phenomenal medical institutions here that I think can really um, uh, create a great place for entrepreneurship and the growing of some of these uh, new, new areas. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. I think uh, with that, Dan. Nice job. I don't know if you're going to get a whole lot of points by not passing out with this crowd. <laughs> the surgery. I, I don't know. Um, but I think Wiener's right. I've never heard anyone quite so bullish on everything. <laughs> Sign me up. Today at the uh, 2014 Medical Innovation Summit and the City Club of Cleveland, we're enjoying a special, a special forum as part of our Business Leader Series with Mark Kwame, co-founder and partner of Drive Capital, in conversation with Professor Michael Goldberg of Case Western Reserve University's Weatherhead School of Management. We encourage you all to formulate your questions now for our speakers and ask that your questions be brief and to the point. You should be sure to tune into our Friday forums on 90.3 WCPN and WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV, all of that is IdeaStream, or one of the many other radio stations across the country that, and the region that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts are made possible, television broadcasts of the City Club of Cleveland are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. This Friday, October 31st, the City Club will host a panel discussion on entitled Turning the Tide on Sexual Assault. For more information about that program or any of our upcoming or past programs, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by the sponsors of the Business Leader Series, including, including Huntington Bank, Downtown Cleveland Alliance, Falls Communications, the Fredonia Group, Inside Business, Level 7, Meaden and Moore, and Walter and Haverfield. We thank you all very much for your support. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by the Cleveland Clinic Genomic Medicine Institute, Companion DX Labs, and John Carroll University. Our community partner for today's program is Flash Starts, which is a key partner in our startups at the City Club Series. Thank you very much for your assistance. And now we would like to return to Mark Kwame and Michael Goldberg for our traditional City Club Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding our microphones today, our Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky. And our uh, marketing and outreach specialist, Kirsten Pianca. We have our first question. Come on. <laughs> Michael's got more, but go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Tarek El Titi. I'm from Cleveland Clinic, all the way from Abu Dhabi, actually. Um, and I'm very interested to know. Um, your view on trying to get international LPs to invest in the Ohio story and you know the value is very sexy and for international investors that, that has appeal and also the opportunity, how realistic is it for some of these startups here to be incubated or grow in international markets? Yeah, I, I, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, when Chris and I uh, went start, did the fundraising process with Drive, we actually did go to Europe. We were invited to go to uh, uh, Dubai and a couple other places, but we had kind of had things locked up by the time that, that came together. Um, I actually think there's a great opportunity. Uh, I think what we have to do is show more, you know, success here. Uh, but you know, the uh, the knowledge of the Cleveland Clinic, the knowledge of Mayo Clinic, the knowledge of you know the large corporations here are, are very well known uh, outside of the United States, and particularly in Europe and in the, in the Middle East. And so I, I actually think it's going to be a, a great time. Um, I think the other thing is. Uh, you know, one, one th people don't really talk about too much Silicon Valley. At Sequoia, for example, over 50% of the companies we funded, uh, the initial uh, entrepreneur was a f um, first generation American or a non native American. So, uh, you know, Jerry Yang at Yahoo, Sergey Brin at Google, uh, Max Levchin at PayPal. Uh, and these people all came from around the world to go to Silicon Valley and started out. In fact, you know, there's a very, you know, the fellow that just did WhatsApp. Uh, you know, he's actually, his family came over, they actually lived on food stamps for quite some time before he got his degree and actually now is a multi-billionaire. Uh, I actually think uh, the immigrant population can't afford to go in Silicon Valley anymore. So I actually think the more and more we can be a, a, uh, a gathering point that, uh, for the immigrant population, you know, here in Ohio and Michigan and in, in Western PA and, and, and all around, I think that's going to really, really help us. 
And in fact, we're already starting to see it. You know, a couple of our entrepreneurs are uh, first generation Americans as well. So I, I think that's something we need to really play out. So I actually think international is going to have a big impact uh, in the entrepreneurial scene in the Midwest. What more can uh, <clears throat> regional universities do to spur uh, economic develop uh, business development? I'm, I'm sorry, could he you? He said, what, what more can uh, regional universities do to s support entrepreneurship and spur economic development? Well, I, I mean, I think the key thing is, um, I, okay, I'll just be blunt. I don't think universities teach entrepreneurship very well. They talk about it theoretically. Um, one of the best experiences I ever had in my life was in high school in junior achievement. In junior achievement, in a 10-week period of time, we had to form a company, we had to find, build a product, we had to, sell the, we had to sell shares in order to build, you know, to raise capital in order to build the product, we had to sell the product, and then at the end we all cashed out and all the partners got money. Doesn't that kind of sound like what you do in entrepreneurship? <laughs> That's where I learned I like to be a marketing guy. I was the VP of marketing of my hanging basket company uh, when I was 16 years old in junior achievement. I mean, in some cases, I think I learned more operating a, uh, um, a lemonade stand uh, off the corner of my house in Sunnyvale, California than I did at University of California, Berkeley in entrepreneurship. Um, I think we got to get people hands on. Think about what the physicist does or think about what you know, the other engineers do. They're programming, they're actually doing stuff. In entrepreneurship, we gotta do stuff, we gotta try things, we gotta do those sorts of things. So I, I think one of the reasons why Stanford has had such great success here is they really push their students to start companies. They push their professors to start companies. You know, for example, uh, Sebastian Thrun, while he was at uh, a, a tenured professor, professor at Stanford, he started a company that then be, uh, Google ended up buying for $80 million, it became Street View, and that's how he got into Google. Um, so you, you, you look at, you, look at um, you know, you gotta have the, the, the faculty and the students, you gotta do it. And the other thing is, what I have found uh, with a lot of universities is they don't like failure. Well, entrepreneurship is all about failure. Um, and that's one thing that we're, help, we're trying our best to tell people here in the Midwest. In, in, in California, you know, my first startup, International Solutions, was a dismal failure. I did it for three years and had to write it off and went off to, you know, as I like to say, sharpen my sword and shine my shield to do the next thing. Uh, here, it's almost like a failure is a scarlet letter. Uh, where there, it's like a badge of honor. And so that's the other thing we gotta do. If you don't try, um, you, you can't make things happen. Well, when you try, I mean, I, I, as I like to say, I mean, people can say, I'm a, people think I'm a decent venture capitalist. I sometimes question that myself. Um, but, you know, 60%-ish of the things I've invested in haven't seen the light of day. Everyone loves to talk about LinkedIn. Everyone loves to talk about the, you know, other success stories. You know, you know people aren't talking about Harmonic, who we wrote off 10, you know, Mark Andreessen, another, you know, very famous investor. He and I invested in Harmonic and we both lost all our money. Uh, so, you know, you got to try these things. You got you to gotta go out and try new things. So I think going back to the universities, I think we have a culture of trying and failing and trying and failing and doing things as practically as possible, I think could be very helpful. Thanks, Mark. Um, actually, you just answered a portion of my question. Um, going back to how can you uh, overcome uh, some of the inherent biases of people who maybe live in the Midwest. I was reading a few months ago about a company that's based here in the Midwest who sees more opportunity on the coast than they see here. So could you kind of talk about how do you overcome the objections from people who actually live in the Midwest who may not recognize all the opportunity that exists here? Well, I mean, you know, again, I, I think it's, it's going to happen over time. Um, and, I mean, you, you have to point to companies like Exact Target in Indianapolis or Angie's List in Indianapolis or uh, what was the other big one in Indianapolis? just forgot its name. But these guys have now spun. I mean, my understanding is Exact Tar Target has already spun off 40 startups uh, from, you know, people who worked at Exact Target. You know, Toe is going to do the same thing here because not everyone's going to want to work for Oracle. Uh, you know, you start seeing that ecosystem sort of build, and that's one thing that was brilliant. I mean, I was very fortunate to grow up in Silicon Valley, and as I've said a couple of times before, I mean, my, my father is the founder of a company called National Semiconductor, which was one of the first semiconductor companies. Well, National Semiconductor, a big chunk of the semi National Semiconductor employees, where'd they go? They went to Apple Computer. 
big chunk of the Apple computer guys went to other places, you know, to Yahoo and Google. I mean, and it creates this very you know, cool ecosystem. And I think what we need to do is continue to create that here in the Midwest. And, you know, again, it's going to take, as I said before, it's just going to take a couple of these things to really, really hit. But we're, we're in the beginning stages, you know. I mean, as I, I think I said to someone the other day, I feel like, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, when Don Valentine started uh, Sequoia Capital, he started in 1972. When my father um, started National Semiconductor in 1967, 100% of his money came from outside of Silicon Valley. Don Valentine started Sequoia, Kleiner Perkins got started, uh, Bill Edwards started a company. And you know, very lucky Cleveland had a David Morgenthaler, who's a world-class VC here. But most of, these, most of the money came from outside the region. Well, then when you, you, you fast forward to Atari Computer, which was funded around 1975, 1974, half their money came from Silicon Valley and half their money came from Boston. One of my favorite stories is Don Valentine. Nolan Bushnell, who started uh, Atari, who was kind of an infamous guy at the time, uh, had, used to have his board meetings in, in hot tubs. <laughs> uh, and so the guy, California investor, of course, got in the hot tub. The guy from Fidelity in Boston did not get in the hot tub. It's kind of hard to be in a hot tub in a coat and tie. <laughs> um, anyway, so that, that, that cultural thing, you by the time Apple Computer happened in 1977, 1978, 100% of their capital came from Silicon Valley. So, you know, that's, I think, I, I look at us right now as 1975. Here, because you, you now have a drive capital, you have an NCT, you have a Draper Triangle, you have some new funds starting to happen. You know, you look at this company down in uh, Listener, down in, uh, down in uh, Cincinnati, who's just funded by three or four outside VCs as well as in, internal VCs. So I'm starting to see that start to happening. And the good news also is, you know, this is actually, it's so much more affordable to be here and we have access to the engineers. I think we can build great, great companies here. So. Anyway, I, I look at it as kind of 1975. Now we just got to continue to execute. Awesome. 1975. Over here, Mark. Yeah. Um, so thank you once again for joining us at the City Club. The, you t mentioned 60%-ish of your investments never saw the light of day, which is, I think a lot of people noticed when you said that. Um, venture investing is really different from investing in, in other ways. Um, whether you're investing in a different sector or you're investing in real estate or whatever, it's a, it's a very different proposition. And you said earlier, too, that there's a lot of money in the Midwest, but not all of that money knows how to do venture. And I wonder if you can talk about that gap, that experience gap, and how that can be overcome, how people like you and others in your role can actually help to educate other investors so that they're comfortable with the level of risk that you've become very comfortable with? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, there's a couple different ways to answer that. I think, first of all, um, Don, John Doerr, one of the managing partners at Kleiner Perkins, has this great line, every time I bring in a new partner, it's like crashing an F-18, it costs me $40 million. My first four investments at Sequoia were, you know, in the ground, a harmonic being one of them. Uh, and so this is an apprenticeship business. Uh, it takes time to learn how to do the business. So if I was a limited partner, Columbus Foundation, or I mean, excuse me, Cleveland Foundation, or somebody like that, um, it's a problem living in Ohio. All three major cities start with a C. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, is, uh, if I was a Cleveland Foundation, for example, I would make sure I'm in investing with folks that have done it before. I mean, quite frankly, if Chris and I, even if I was you know, Jobs Ohio guy, came in here, you know, if I was Silicon Valley exec, we would not have raised the money. The fact that I had 12 years experience and he had eight, nine years experience in venture capital, the traditional LPs know what, uh, limited partners, those guys that give us money, uh, know what to do. So I think the first thing is to really understand you, you want to work with folks who have done it before. I actually think there's a, you know who one of the top investors on the planet is right now? There's a guy named Jim Getz. Do you know who Jim Getz is? Jim Getz is, was my partner at Sequoia. Jim Getz invested in, he started his own company, went to Excel, did a couple of great companies there. He did WhatsApp now, Palo Alto Networks, uh, AdMob, many others. He's created multi, uh, you know, probably 20, 30, 40 billion dollars of market cap. You know where Jim Getz is from? Cleveland, Ohio. He grew up here. What we need to do is, Jim Getz is probably too far along. What we need to do is find folks that are from here and from these areas, like my partner Chris Olson is from Cincinnati. So he had an affinity to the Midwest. He's a world-class investor. My partner who's sitting back there, Ned Schwartz, was working for, um, 
uh, Norwest, one of the premier investors in Silicon Valley, and who he grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and other than the fact that his mother wrote me a big check, no, just kidding, <laughs> um, we attracted him back to, uh, to drive capital uh, because he was able to do what he did at drive capital like he did at Norwest in a place that he really liked. So, so if, I, if I looked at it, one is, is find experience folks, okay, two that have an affinity or love for the area, and, uh, and three, understand what we're good at and what we're not good at. One thing I did at Jobs Ohio that I was pretty proud of is we were trying to, we were spraying and praying all the development dollars. Uh, and that just doesn't work. So I said, okay, what's Ohio really, really, really good at? You know, from medical devices up here down to, uh, you know, financial services in Columbus to retail. I mean, really figure out the areas that we're really good at and focus in on those areas uh, and whatever area you're investing in. So I, I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that we have a modicum of success uh, that people take notice, and then other folks who are from the Midwest begin to start firms like ours in Chicago, in Cleveland. We need, I mean, the number one thing I worry about is we have no trading partners. I have to go to the coast. Anytime I want to raise for one of our companies more than five million bucks, maybe 10 million bucks, I have to go to the coast, primarily to Silicon Valley. So we need trading partners. So hopefully, you know, we can attract some of those folks here and, and, and grow the whole ecosystem. Thanks again, Mark, for joining us today, Dan Walsh. Um, uh, great segue there with regard to needing trading partners. When you were out raising money, you probably had to paint a picture of what success looks like and what the future looks like. What are some of the, uh, what's the time frame you talked about? And what are the guideposts of what that success looks like? You kind of started from 1985 to how we get to 2015, right? Right, exactly. So, I mean, are you talking about from the, a VC firm perspective? Investor's perspective. So um, it, it, the, what an LP is looking for, if you can return three times capital net of fees uh, in a 10-year period, that is a top decile fund. So it's a mid-teens. One thing we always used to say at Sequoia is because of the risk level of venture capital, we should be 10% over your favorite average. So if the average is 12, 13, 2 or 3 percent in today's world, you know, we should be 13, 14 percent. So success from an LP's perspective is, you know, in the teens, if you will. Now, there are funds that I've participated in uh, and others have where, you know, we've returned 20x, 20 times the invested capital or 15. So every once in a while you have, you know, great, great, great success. But 3x is kind of what you should expect. Uh, the other thing you should expect is it's your money's tied up for a while. Um, basically, it's, a, it's about a three to four year investment phase. So uh, you'll invest about 70% of the total. So if we're a $250 million fund in kind of four years, we'll invest about $200 million. The rest will be for reserves and fees and other things. And um, so you'll invest kind of 80, 70, 80% of the fund in four years. You don't start reaping those rewards until like year seven, year eight, year nine, okay? Um, and so it just, it's, it's a good 10-year deal. Now, one thing I see about venture capital, I always like to say, we always make lemons before we make lemonade. And I'm sure for those of you in the investing community, you've heard of the J curve. The way venture capital works is you lose money, your fund's underwater in the beginning because you make lemons, before, you know, companies go out of business, go out of back business faster than they return capital to you. And then all of a sudden you start seeing it, it go. Uh, the funny thing about this business, I was actually just talking to my former partner, Mike Moritz, who's one of the top venture capitalists in the world. And I'll never forget when I first started Sequoia, we just finished investing Sequoia 7. And um, I, asked, I asked Mike, I said, Mike, uh, which companies do you think are gonna be big hits? You know, you've been doing this for a long time. He goes, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, what you do is just invest in large markets. You hope things happen, um, but you know, you know, you just never really know. Um, Tom Perkins of Kleiner Perkins fame used to say, "This business is 90% timing and 10% luck." <laughs> I.e., it's 100% luck with some. You know, you make your own luck to some degree. So it, it's a tough, tough business. But when it works, it's a pretty spectacular thing. Um, and not only for the community, but for the LPs. I'm very proud of the fact that when I was at Sequoia, we made a lot of money for many great, great causes. Over 90% of our investors were from no our nonprofits, basically, uh, you know, uh, ch universities or uh, charitable foundations. Pretty much the same thing here at Drive. A big chunk of them are 
from uh, charitable foundations or, or universities or others. So hopefully we'll, we'll have a great return and, and move forward. But that that's kind of gives you the metrics. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I, I think basically in order to attract more, more participants, we need to have a couple more exact targets. Um, I'll give you a little statistic that helped us on our reign, you know, on our fundraising. We did, remember, we fundraised primarily in 2013. Uh, we put together a list. We actually looked at, uh, in, in areas that we would be investors, uh, or venture capital participated uh, in the Midwest, there were, if you looked at, there were 50 companies that, uh, exited either be, were purchased or went public for over a billion dollars. Uh, created about $144 billion of market value in the Midwest from 2007 to 2012. Um, if you look at that exact same period and you put that against Silicon Valley, actually turns out, uh, if you take Facebook out, okay, because that was a biggie, if you take Facebook out, uh, Midwest outperforms Silicon Valley. Uh, another interesting statistic, many of you may heard of Cambridge Associates. They're the big advisor for limited partners to invest in, um, in venture funds. One of our LPs really, really, really wanted to invest in Drive, but his investment committee was saying, eh, you can't do it in the Midwest, forget it, you know, you got to be in Silicon Valley. By the way, we could, Chris and I could have raised our fund in 90 days or less if we stayed in Silicon Valley, by the way. Um, so anyway, so he went to Cambridge Associates and said, uh, could you just forget the VC firms, tell me on the, an investment level which regions of the country are the best performing regions. And so, you know, there's a lot of companies in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of companies, you know, so he basically looked at uh, the West Coast, he looked at uh, Midwest, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, uh, the, um, and the Southwest, and Southeast. Um, guess the number one performing region with 670 companies over the last 10 years invested, the number one performing region in the country is the Midwest by 300 basis points, okay? Now you may ask, then why aren't the VCs doing better here? Well, the problem is, is unfortunately they weren't investors in those big, big winners. Uh, they were mainly being invested in by outside uh, venture capitalists who were picking them off in their growth stages. Uh, and then, you know, so what I think actually is going to happen, the other thing that's going to happen here, I think the attrition rate's much lower here. And so I think in, like in the Valley, you have much more kind of, you write a big check and it goes to zero kind of thing. Mm. Whereas here, you can write smaller checks, get the company going, you can see it expand and then, and then, and then take it uh, higher from there. So, uh, you know, I believe this is the best place to start a company. Um, I'm betting my career on it. Um, and uh, I, just, I just really, really do believe that. Now, you know, in, I gotta tell you, living in you know, Sunnyvale and then Saratoga, California in the middle of Silicon Valley in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was no better place on the planet. Um, I think you know, this area, you know, kind of, I kind of take Pittsburgh down to Cincinnati, to Indianapolis, to Chicago, this kind of general area to Cleveland and back. This general area, in my belief, is the best place to start a technology company because it's got all the right ingredients, the universities, the research, the GDP, the customers, um, I think, and, and the cost of living is actually reasonable, so. Um, could you talk a little bit about the human qualities of life here that you find particularly attractive and that perhaps aren't quite as prevalent in, uh, in California? Sure. Uh, no, actually, people are nice here. <laughs> um, I'll never forget, I was going to a Jumpstart event, and I'm lost over by their offices, and I'm sitting on the side of the road trying to figure out where to go. And this car comes up behind me, beside me, and rolls down his window. I literally thought I was being robbed. Um, and the guy looks at me and goes, can I help you? You look like you're lost. Um, you know, I mean, people are nice. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. Here, here's another little statistic for you. We have 100% of the people we've tried to recruit to work in our companies here in the Midwest, we have gotten 100%. This is a great place to live. It's a great place to raise a family. It's a great place if you're a young adult. I mean, think about what's going on in downtown Cleveland right now. Think about what's going on in downtown Columbus. Or, you know, if you guys been down in Cincinnati, over the Rhine feels like south of market San Francisco to me. Um, so this is a phenomenal place, you know, wherever you are in your, in your uh, um, you know, age demographic. In addition, you can actually afford to buy a house. What a neat concept. 
The house I bought when I was 28 years old, I had a job at Wise Technology. I bought a house in Mountain View, California for $144,000. I sold that house two years later for $295,000. That house sold last year for $1.6 million. That house, by the way, is a three bedroom, one bathroom house that's 1,400 square feet built in 1952 with no modifications. Hmm. Okay, this is a great place to live. We just attracted one of the top guys from Google, Nick, to work for us at Drive Capital. If I showed you what he lived in, I mean, he could live in, was it Shaker Heights here? For the price of a house, he lived in you know, this tiny little postage stamp house in, uh, in uh, Palo Alto, in uh, San Jose, California. So this is a great place to do it. And uh, I just, you know, there, there's a couple you know, things we have uh, that are issues. I mean, one is access to capital, let's be frank. Uh, we got we got to deal with that. Um, the other is uh, is air transport. It's not great. I mean, uh, one of my big problems in Columbus attracting folks, attracting VCs, is you know unless they have their own private plane, they don't want to fly to Columbus. It's too hard. Um, and see, you know, look at what's going on in Cincinnati. Look at what's going on in Cleveland. I mean, there there are issues. It's actually in some ways easier than Chicago because they have so many flights in and out of O'Hare and and Midway. But um, but this is the best place to do it. I mean, and I fundamentally believe it. And I think what we got to do is we just got to continue to pound that drum and not be um, apologetic for what we're doing, what's going on. The change of seasons is a good thing. When you live in California, it's always one kind of weather. Enjoy the snow. I love the snow. I actually really love the snow. Um, I love fall. We were driving up here uh, from uh, Columbus. Boy, the fall. You know, foliage is great. We got to, there's a reason why Hollywood is in California. Because we're great self-promoters. We need to be more self-promoting here in, in Ohio and in the Midwest. This is a great, great place. And sometimes I think, of my, you know, I just, you, you, when you come from the outside, you see it more. When you're here, you don't see it. I mean, I, I know Silicon Valley, and, and I, I was in kind of like the premier spot in Silicon Valley. Um, and it's not all that it's struck up to be. And we can do it here. It's just going to take a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, and a little bit of luck, and we'll make it happen. Hi, Mark. Uh, yesterday we spoke a little bit on the SEC deregulation of crowdfunding through equity, as well as we see angel investors are pushing back later stage of financing and the, uh, I guess, the less fragmented uh, venture capital market. Some are saying it's actually drying up. Uh, what major issues do you see in the entrepreneurial finance pipeline, and how do you see it in the future? For, for crowdfunding in particular? Uh, just crowdfunding, uh, the venture capital funding shrinking up and angel investors pushing back to later stage investments. Yeah, so I think there's, there's two things going on. That was kind of two separate. Let's talk about crowdfunding first. Crowdfunding, I think, is, is, a, is a really great new invention. Um, we actually just recently invested in a company called Beam that's doing a very, very cool toothbrush. It's not just a toothbrush, but anyway, I won't go into all that. Mm. One thing about venture capital is we always shamelessly plug our companies. <laughs> um, and so anyway, so but that company got started through crowdfunding. They sold 8,000 of their toothbrushes. And that's kind of how it got them going and, and, and things started to happen. I mean, you're seeing these great Kickstarter campaigns or fundable campaigns. It kind of gets these companies, you know, Oculus. You know, Oculus is probably the poster boy, right? So Oculus does a crowdfunding on Kickstarter and what, a year later is bought by Facebook for $2 billion? Uh, talk about efficient use of capital. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I mean, I think it's a great area. Um, I don't think it's the end all be all. Uh, and maybe it's because I think I add some value. Um, you know, money is, money is fungible, money is money. But if you have an experienced venture capitalist with you, you know, whether it's someone from Drive or Kleiner Perkins or Andreessen Horowitz, I mean, they, it, you know, it's pattern recognition. You see things, you advise, you, you, you can help. I, I think there's a reason why the companies that have a, a higher order of success and large success are VC funded companies because they have folks sitting on the board who've been there, done that, and can actually add some advice. So I, I actually think crowdfunding is a great thing to kind of get something kick-started, to use that phrase. But then I think you're going to want to still have traditional funding. The issue you bring up is a great example uh, of what's going on in the VC business. You are right that the, the number of VCs is declining for two reasons. 
Uh, one is a lot of people in the late 90s, early 2000s thought, you know, everyone was printing money and everything was paid with gold and everyone should be, everyone who's a VC will make money. Well, guess what? It's a really hard business and most of them did not even return their fund and, or, or even worse. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of those guys are going out of business now, are basically going, going away because it's their, they're into their 10, 12 year cycle. I think what's, uh, the other thing that's happening is you got the Sequoia Capitals, the Greylocks, the Kleinerbergs, um, um, raising these monster funds, these billion dollar funds, 800 million, 900 million, billion dollar funds. Well, uh, venture capital is an alternative um, asset class, so these LPs only have so much they'll put into it, a one, two, three percent of their, uh, of their base. And so what, what, uh, what you're seeing is the, the, a lot of money is going to the big players, therefore, they're focused on growth investing. Because when you have a billion dollar fund, you can't afford to take any principal risk. Uh, and it's a very different kind of investing than early stage investing. So you're absolutely right, those are two trends. What I am hoping is that, you know, for example, in, in Silicon Valley now, there are more than 40 or 50 companies that have zero revenue, but have billion dollar plus valuations. And so there comes a time when you can't continue to do that because the, the markets, at the end of the day, you, you've been hearing it from Bill Gurley now and Mark Andreessen and others that, woo, crazy times again, 1999, all over again, 2000, be, be careful, be careful, be careful. I mean, did you see that company recently? I have no idea what they do. I'm trying to find out just for fun. Just raised, they have no product in the market. It's just a piece of technology. Just raised $575 million from Google, Kleiner Perkins, Andreessen Horowitz. Magic leap. You guys hear about that? So 500, and these guys have zero revenue. Okay, so you know, again, that may be the greatest thing in, 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 from sliced bread, I don't know. It may be, a, everyone who's seen it says it's absolutely magical. It's this idea that through some glass or something, you're able to fully manipulate three-dimensional objects and almost feel them in your hands. So pretty cool, but who, who knows? But anyway, that's, a, that's a, uh, the best way I can answer your, your, those two questions. Absolutely wonderful, Mark. Thank you for those really insightful and, uh, and educational comments. Thank you all for so many of your questions. I also want to thank LifeBank. I neglected to mention you during the, uh, during the earlier announcements. LifeBank, if you don't know, ends with a C, and they organize organ transplantation. They're fantastic, and they're a sponsor of today's program. I thank you very much. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a special Business Leader Series Forum at the Cleveland Clinic Medical Innovation Summit, featuring Mark Kwame, co-founder and partner of Drive Capital, in conversation with Michael Goldberg of Case Western Reserve University's Weatherhead School of Management. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for attending. Thank you both for your participation. Our forum is adjourned.